Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're going to get started here, inshallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala khairi khalqillah, nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man wala. Allahumma laka alhamd kama yambaghi li jalali wajhik wa li azimi sultanik la nuhsi thana'an alayk. Anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman ya rabbal alameen. Allahumma razuqna al-ikhlas fil qawli wal amal. Uh, so inshallah, we're going to just jump right in. Uh, before I start, this topic is, I think, really important. And so I didn't trust myself with it. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. But I really, really benefited, benefited from the work of uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Shannawi, who uh, wrote an amazing article. And I think it's based off of something in Arabic. Alaykum as wa rahmatullah. It, uh, on the problem of evil And so this talk really To be very honest Is a summary of that And so if you want to read the article To have a, a, a better Complete understanding I really suggest you do that Inshallah We'll have like the link uh, You know mentioned below As well But that's to be able to read Not everyone likes to read So this is the talk version of it Inshallah I'm going to do my best To do it justice but it really helped me to be able to like put in my mind and then inshallah articulate uh, how do we deal with this issue. And, and the reason that we say it's such an important issue because I, it is something I think that, that um, comes on, like it comes to each and every single one of our minds. You know, like if... if not necessarily in questioning Allah, if or questioning Allah's existence, but in questioning like why does Allah allow certain things to happen, you know? And and so it's a very common, uh, I would say, issue that can turn into a doubt as well. And it is actually uh, the number one reason that has been documented through surveys and polling of why atheists or agnostics, or say atheists, they, re- they say they refuse to believe in God because of the problem of evil, the idea of human suffering, the dilemma of why is there evil in this world. Uh, and if, you know, they, they use this line of thinking. They say, if God is good, then how come he allows for so much evil in the world? If he is so powerful, can't he stop that evil from happening? And then they'll throw like a scenario. They'll say, you know, if you saw a child with cancer, you know, one of the leading atheists, this, they asked him, why do you not believe in God? And he said, bone cancer in children. That was his answer, okay? Uh, and so they'll, they'll give, they'll, they'll have, like, there's an, this emotional appeal. They'll say, if you saw a child suffering from cancer, wouldn't you, if you had the ability to cure that child, wouldn't you do that? And so any like compassionate person or just anyone with a heart would say, of course, of course I would, right? So then they say, well, if you're saying God is all powerful and God is good and God loves and these things, then then why wouldn't God do that, right? And so then they make that connection. They say the fact that these things exist show us that God doesn't exist, okay? And so we're trying to address this line of thinking here and even more importantly, trying to show why, uh, first of all, why it's a flawed way of thinking. And then second of all, like it that has nothing to do with the existence of God actually at all. And then number two, what's our perspective towards these things, right? And we kind of personalized it when we said, why do bad things happen to good people, right? Because a lot of times that's when we care. You know, if you just think about it in your own life, uh, a lot, and I'm just being very honest here, you know, for, for myself, maybe I'll live an entire life not really that deeply impacted by why people are starving in another you know, country or on another continent. But when something happens in my life that I can't reconcile or that I'm having a hard time accepting, then I start to say, well, you know, if God did exist or if God is so kind, how come he's letting 
those people starve and how come he's letting them go through that, right? So we turn it instead of, so it's not like I'm being selfish here. Then I turn it to like what's happening in the world. But sometimes the root of the problem is like, I feel like things are not going well in my life. Why did this evil thing happen in, in, my, in my life, right? So it is a really important thing to address. And so we've been, you know, kind of pushing this one off for a while, but we said this is something we definitely have to talk about. And I'm not claiming that I'm going to do this topic justice or completely, uh, you know, encompass it, but just inshallah to give us some, uh, some basic ideas that we can benefit from, hopefully. I know I benefited from these things when I first heard them. And then to help others who are struggling with the same concept, okay? So that question of like, why is the world so messed up? We'll start with that. And I think what's important with that is that we really ask ourselves or we really question that question. Like, is the world really that chaotic as some like to make it seem? Is the world really that messed up? And if you actually look at it objectively and fairly, what we see is no, it's actually not. And so it's important to begin there. We can't like fall victim to like just emotional appeals. The world's falling apart. It's so messed up. People are doing this in this part of the world and then that part, like, and it becomes an emotional appeal. But if you, if you actually objectively look at it, what we find is that the default, the rule in the world is the exact opposite. We find harmony, we find precision, we find order, we find health, we find pres prosperity as the defaults, okay? Just look at the human being. The vast majority of human beings, do they spend the majority of their life healthy or sick, right? The vast majority. Think about in your own life. Think, count the days in your life that you've been sick, you can probably count them on your hands versus the days that you've been healthy, which is the majority of your life, okay? Are the vast majority of human beings fully functional or have some type of impairments, okay? When we look at it, the vast majority are fully functional. And by the way, even those who have impairments, disabilities, maybe special needs, even that is actually... A, a sign of order. Because if we see, and this is a little bit, I'm not trying to get philosophical here, but if you actually look at it, if someone, for example, they go blind, okay, or they're born blind, or they're born without the ability to, like they're, they're born maybe missing a limb, right? Or missing fingers, right? That going wrong, and them still coming out, going wrong, and them still coming out functional, for example, a person comes out without eyes, blind, but they're able to taste, they're able to smell, they're able to breathe, they're able to still walk and talk, right? That shows that so much went right in such a perfect way to get them to that point, okay? But what we're saying is, so even in, even, even in disabilities, even impairments, we see actually that there is order in that, Okay, but the majority of human beings are fully functional, right? If you look at the, your, your body, does the majority of the blood that flows through, does it flow freely? Or is it more common in the human being that it clogs up and that it blocks the arteries, right? The volcano, like let's look at the earth, a volcano, is it spent, is more time spent dormant or is there more time when it's spent erupting? And even when it erupts, what do we see? We see actually benefit in that. It resets the ecological balance, for example, okay? So when we look at these things, and you can keep going, you can keep going. But when we look at these things, what we understand is that the prevalent norm is what? The prevalent norm is, like we said, order, health, prosperity, and that there is far more good in the world than there is evil. And that actually reminds us and it's a proof for us that there must be a God. So it's the exact opposite proof. We're proving through this that there must be a God. Why? Look at it from this perspective, okay? If, there, if we live in a world that the existence is defined by more good than evil, 
then this means that there is there must be something keeping this world in order. There must be something keeping the precision, keeping the balance, keeping the harmony. What's keeping the world, the earth, spinning in the way that it's spinning, at the distance that it's spinning, to keep life perfectly able to, to exist? What's keeping the sun rising every single day at the time that we know it's going to rise? What's keeping this entire system moving in such precision and balance and harmony, right? In physics, right, for those, and I'm sure the majority of people here are in the sciences, so excuse me if I say something dumb, from my, it's been a long time since I took a science class, right? But in, in, in physics, what we have the second law of thermodynamics, right? Entropy, which says what? That if a system is left on its own, Right? What's going to happen? It's going to spiral out of control. Okay? It will increase in irreversible chaos. Unless there's something external that acts as an influence to hold it together. Otherwise, what happens? It just will fall apart. That's just when something is in random or when something is just left to its own, like this enclo- this closed system, it will gradually but consistently move towards chaos and falling apart blind forces can never maintain structure okay so the fact that life is sustainable means that there must be a god okay and so what this does not only does it prove for us that there is god as one of the proofs that we say that for for allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence but it also it reminds us when we look at the idea of good and evil and chaos in the world happening, that there must be an explanation to the evil. If we establish what the rule is and what the exception is, then we can figure out what to do with the exception. Okay? So it's very important. The rule is order. The rule is harmony. The rule is balance. And so if there is an exception we can find an explanation for that exception. One of the best examples I heard for this is imagine that you go to a palace, a home. How, you know, uh, we used to, back in the day it was, uh, I'm not going to say, it was a show called Cribs, okay? Where you go into, you get, you get the, the, the VIP full access tour to this home. Beautiful palatial mansion. Okay, and you walk into this mansion and it is just stunning. The architecture, the design, everything about it is just perfect. The technology, you have the smart fridge, you have robot coming and taking your coat from you and hanging it up, right? You have just the the holograms, the TV screens dropping down. You go in the bathroom, (laughs) you go in the bathroom and you have, you know, While you're in the bathroom taking a shower, you have TV screens, right? Everything is just immaculate. What do you, what, what, what's the conclusion that you come to? Whoever designed this house, on point, on point. Amazing engineer, amazing architect, amazing design. And maybe it was Omar who picked out the colors because that's, it's just beautiful inside. I'm just joking. But, uh, it's, maybe. It's just, it's just immaculate, okay? Then you go in the house, you go to one room. You, you walk into the third floor, you, you make a, a left, two doors down, you walk into this room and what do you find? You find a room that is unfinished. You find a room that is full of dust and dirt, cobwebs, no electricity, right? Mud, it's just something's, it's just, it hasn't been done, okay? What do you conclude when you see that room? Do you conclude that the engineers must have been, must have been dumb? They must have not known what they're doing. It must have all happened by chance, by chaos. Or do you conclude that there must be a reason that that room is like that? Either, for example, you can say that, you know, the engineer, uh, the, the, the owner of that house ran out of money. And so he couldn't complete that room yet. Or you can say, for example, that he chose, you know, maybe this is someone who grew up in poverty. And so he wanted to keep like one room in that house to remind him of like where he came from. You know, those are going to be more likely explanations, right? But you will never come to the conclusion that 
This is just chaos. This is just dumb. Because you saw the rest of that house. Okay? And so it's similar. And for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the highest example. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? It, when we reflect on the creation of Allah, how much in the Qur'an does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala point to the creation? How much does He point to this perfect and this beautiful system that we overlook so often? Why? Because we're just, we take it for granted. We're used to it. Just now, the Imam in, in Salat al-Isha, he was reading from, I think, the beginning of Surah al-Ra'd, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us these examples of like how you can have you know, a, a tract of land and it's the same water and it's the same soil and it's the same, it's being tended to and you, yet you have two completely different and separate plants that come out with two completely separate qualities and all of these things. Where does, what, how beautiful is that, is that, uh, is that precision and that, and that, uh, uh, that, that balance and that beauty, right? That's, that's the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when we see that, we see this, this, this perfection, then we recognize that when we see something wrong, when we see chaos, when we see what we call natural disaster, when we see evil, there must be an explanation to these things. There has to be, right? And that's why, one of the reasons that our teachers, they mention, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, teach us to recite Surah Al-Kahf on a weekly basis. And this is something, a side note, anytime you see something being uh, recommended or commanded for us to recite, to come back to multiple times, that there has to be a, a, a wisdom and a benefit and something really practical for you in your life. right? Like Surah Al-Fatiha, 17 times a day at least you're reciting it. There's something in there for you to, to take Practically for your life, okay? So Surah Al-Kahf, every Friday, it's recited. Why? Because it has within it these stories that repeat the human experience, that are so relevant to us, that are timeless in the lessons that they're teaching. In the story of Musa and Khidr, we see this particular thing, it manifested so beautifully. How Musa alayhi salam, he sees these, what he sees to be these, these evils, these apparent evils that he is unable to initially process. It's not until later on when there's disclosure, when he gains more knowledge that it becomes clear to him. It's not until his, uh, he is enlightened with additional information from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through revelation that what he, re- he initially sees to be evil wasn't actually pure evil, but it was relative evil, right? So his initial frame of reference wasn't enough, okay? But once we recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most wise, then we are able to recognize and believe that nothing, that nothing exists in this world that's pure evil. It's a matter of perspective. Okay, And it's not to say that we don't suffer. No, we suffer. We experience pain. We experience loss. And those are difficult things. Right? But the evil sometimes that we see as like this is so evil or pure evil is only because we're looking at it from an incorrect lens. Or we're not seeing the complete picture. Right? And so we recognize this important principle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and we do not know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests us in our belief of Him, right? When Allah tests us, He says, "Alladina amanu wa amilu salihat," those who believe and who do righteous deeds. So the test is not in just in, in in action; the test is in belief as well. Are we going to trust Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in our belief of Him, right? And the analogy, and I gave this analogy before to some of the high schoolers. I think it's so beautiful though. The analogy in, in recognizing how limited our perspective can be, but the analogy of, of the ants on the carpet, right? To be able to, to accept our own uh, just limited perspective, our own lack of knowledge. It's a huge test of humility that we're given. That we know less 
than an ant on a carpet compared to the carpet maker. What's the example that he gives? He gives this example of imagine you have, you know, everyone now is bringing their, their, uh, their prayer rugs to, to, to the masjid, right? I have one, alhamdulillah, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Got it from Medina. It, it, looks, like, it looks like the, the Rolda carpet, okay? It's green, a lot of design on it. A little distracting sometimes, but it's beautiful, right? Imagine an ant on that carpet. The ant on that carpet doesn't see the beauty that I see. He doesn't see the beauty that the carpet maker sees. The ant just sees chaos because the ant is so close to that carpet. So what, do the, what does the ant see? It sees a green piece of string going this way. It sees, it sees a yellow string going that way. It sees a gold thing going this way. It sees like a black dot just right in front of it. It's chaos. It's a jungle. Why? Because it's so close. It can't see. Right? But if you were to step back, if that ant was able to see what we're able to see from that carpet, it would see a masterpiece. It would see something beautiful. Right? And so the test of humility is for us to recognize that we have less knowledge compared to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the ant compared to the carpet maker. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the picture. We only have the pixel. We only have the pixel. And so it allows for us to, to recognize like the angels recognized. When they asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's so beautiful that Allah gives us this in the beginning of the Qur'an. The angels ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because they don't know what it means to disobey Allah. They ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are you going to put on earth someone a human being like this creation that causes chaos, that spills blood on the earth, right? They're not asking to like, to, to rebel or to like, to show like, like, you know, some sort of objection. They're asking out of like curiosity to know what's the answer that Allah gives them. Allah doesn't say, yeah, you know, some of them are going to overcome. Some of them, they're going to, you know, get past those desires and they're going to be righteous people and do goodness. What's the answer? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very clearly says, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what you do not know. And the angels were completely satisfied by that fact. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows more than them and that they don't know. And so this becomes part of our test. Sometimes things happen that we don't fully understand why. In the moment, maybe later on, maybe much later even, we still are trying to grapple with it. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and we do not know. Right? And so then how do we make sense of what we perceive as evil and suffering all around us and in our lives? They give a five-step process. Okay? Number one, and we, we, we kind of went through them already, but just so you, you kind of see them. Right? Number one, we recognize Allah tells us so often that He is the most wise. He makes that very clear to us. Okay? So we recognize, number one, Allah is the most wise. Okay. Number two, as a result of Him being the most wise, that that must mean that Allah's wisdom must be behind everything that exists. Anything that Allah allows to exist, there must, it must be driven. It must have the wisdom behind it. It has to. It has to. Because Allah doesn't do, it's not, Allah is not like us. Allah doesn't just do things haphazardly. But Allah, all of His actions, as He tells us, Hakimun Alim, right? The most knowledgeable and the most wise. Number three is that that wisdom, it necessitates that in the existence of evil, that there must be profound benefits. There must be profound benefits. Okay? Number four, God's wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wisdom, His wisdom, also necessitates that we can't know the benefit for every trial. Okay, why? Because if, if we did, then it wouldn't be a trial. If you're given the answer to the exam while you're taking the exam, is it an exam? Or is it just a review session? I know we would love that, but it's not an exam, right? Unless you're cheating on the exam, that's a whole different story, but you can't do that. Right? But if we were given the answers, then it's not an exam. So part of the wisdom that, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, not telling us the, the, the benefits for every uh, evil or for everything that we see happens is, because, is, is to test 
our submission to test uh, our reliance, our trust, our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then number five is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, part of His wisdom also is that He necessitates that some of the answers behind evil existing, He gives it to us. He gives us some of those answers. Why? Because He knows that we need to be able to have some of that, at least some kind of reassurance and comfort as we navigate the hardships of life. Right? It's, it's part of human nature. We need some type of like reassurance. We need some type, like I need to know that it's, 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 there's a reason. I need to know that there's something there that, that, like that to, to get me through this. I need to see the light, even a glimmer of that light at the end of the tunnel. Okay, so Allah does give us throughout the Qur'an, throughout the stories of the prophets, throughout our own lives, He does allow us to see some of those wisdoms, either right away or either later on, right? And so, what are some of those wisdoms, right? This is something that the scholars spoke at length about. And each and every single one of us can take this as an exercise in our own lives, right? Why certain things happen to me in my life, that in the moment that when they happen, I have no idea in fact, I, I, I was begging Allah that this thing did not happen and it happened, right? And I was so upset and I was so hurt and I was so angry. I made dua and I made dua and it didn't happen or it happened in a way that I didn't want it to happen. And I was just, I didn't know why. But subhanAllah, maybe a day later, maybe a week later, maybe a month later, maybe years later, we saw the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan in those things. I didn't get to marry this person because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved for me so, someone so much better for me. It didn't work out with this person because if it had worked out with them, I would have lost myself. I would have been angry with Allah if He allowed it to work out. Because I look back at it and I see how toxic it actually was. That I wasn't able to see in that moment because I was so blinded. For example, right? I didn't get into that school, I didn't get that job, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me something so much better or He protected me from an evil that I could see that if I had experienced that, that maybe that would have been the end of me, right? So in our own lives, we can do this exercise to recognize that there is a benefit. And Allah, He gives us, and also in Surah Al-Baqarah, the second surah in the Qur'an, He gives us this, this principle. He says, وَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ وَعَسَىٰ أَن تُحِبُّ شَيْئًا وَهُوَ شَرٌ لَكُمْ Maybe that you will hate something and it actually is good for you. Maybe you'll love something and it actually is not good for you. Then what does he say at the end? وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ وَأَنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you do not know. Right? So if we can get past that doubt or that point, that thing in our, that, that like, that, like that crutch in our mind of is there a wisdom? If we can get past that and we say, no, there is a wisdom, there is a lesson, there is a benefit, that not only will give us peace of mind and heart, eventually at least, but it will also allow us to start to be able to see those wisdoms as well. Right? Because we're no longer doubting. Is, we're not stuck at that question. Is there or is there not a wisdom? But we, are, we get past that. We say, no, there is a wisdom. I just have to figure it out sooner or later. Right? So what are some of the wisdoms? What are some of the benefits in general to these hardships, to these evils that we see, whether it's in our lives or in the world? Why do bad things happen to good people? Right? Uh, they gave a few, and I'll, I'll mention them, inshallah, briefly. But the, number one, they say to make life more meaningful. Right? It's a staircase in a, an evaluatory experience for our hereafter. Right? People who, you know, they, they want to paint an evil picture and say, you know, uh, of a child starving or of, you know, someone being murdered and, and the murderer getting away. You know, they'll, they'll paint this evil picture and they'll say, They'll preface, they'll say, how do you explain this with God, right? And they'll say, don't, they'll, they'll qualify and say, don't tell me life is a test. Don't just throw that excuse, right? And say that there's a hereafter. 
I want to know about this world. Why do they say that? Why do they qualify that? Because if there is a hereafter, the problem of evil, it evaporates. It disappears. Why? If there's a hereafter, then every injustice, every oppression, every evil that exists in this world will be settled sooner or later. If someone gets away with evil in this world, with oppression in this world, they will not get away with it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? If someone is oppressed themselves in this world, an entire life of oppression, and they never got their justice in this world, they will not only be given justice by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they will be dealt with with immense uh, mercy and grace by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about it. A person experiences a hundred years of oppression in this life. If they were given a hundred years of goodness by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the next life, that would be considered justice, right? You could say that's justice. They're not given just a hundred years though. If they were patient, if they, if they held on to, their, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to their belief in Him, they're given eternity. They're given eternity. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, gives us this example of the person, he says, the person who experiences the most difficult life, that their entire life was hardship and evil and pain. Entire life. What happens? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, this person is dipped in Jannah. Just has a moment in Jannah, and then they're asked, what was your life like? How was the hardships that you experienced? What they, what, what's their answer? What hardships? It goes away. It goes away. Right? And so, that, that, that's the difference between believing that this life is purposeless or purposeful. Yes, if you do not believe in an akhirah, in a hereafter, you will never find <coughs> full peace or full justice or full satisfaction in this world. You will not. But that's why we have an akhirah. That's why it's such a core part of our belief. Not to say, oh, that means just ignore oppression or allow yourself to be wronged in this world. That's not what we're saying, right? I, I don't think that even needs to be clarified. But, but to recognize that if you do not get it in this world, you will get it in the akhirah. So there, there's, a, there's, there's purpose that's, that, that, that our struggles, that this evil that we see in this world, it has. In the, in the light of the next, right? Number two, they said, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to forgive us. And sometimes we drag our feet to that forgiveness. And so the prick, every, as the scholars, they say, every prick of every thorn is an opportunity to be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That what He puts us through, that sometimes is the result of our own actions, is an opportunity for us to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to wake up, to recognize the reality of this world, to recognize that maybe our actions are taking us so far away from, from, from benefit, from goodness in this world, away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so Allah brings us back to Him through these, these calamities, these hardships, through these difficulties, right? And a person may ask, they say, well, couldn't God just forgive us without putting us through these things? Right? You could say, yes, he could. But we have to remember also that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just as well. That there is requital, there is retribution. Right? That we, we balance those attributes of Allah. And how is it fair that a person just does evil and, and, and has no, there's no consequence to that? Right? Number three on that same note, that it helps us, the difficulties, that, what we experience in this world help us build an, in, an awareness to the insignificance of this world. To the insignificance of this world. There's an author, his name is C.S. Lewis, okay? I'm sure he's written good things. I just know he's famous, right? I don't, I've never read any of his work, at least not that I know of. He has an interesting quote though. He said, God, this is his quote, he says, God whispers to us in our times of pleasure, right? And he speaks in our conscience, but he screams in our pains and in our difficulties. Right? It's a, it's a very powerful quote. It's his megaphone, he says, 
that he uses to rouse a deaf world. You know, how many... That's what it is, the Chronicles of Narnia. I knew I recognized the name. So I guess I did read his book in like fifth grade. But... Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm, 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 not, I'm not the most well-read in English literature, but uh, if it was written originally in English, I don't know. But, but what, what he's saying here is that those things that we see, they bring us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, one of the most, uh, the most amazing people, someone I have, wallahi, such a, a deep level of respect for is Muhammad Ali, rahimahullah. Amazing. Ama- not just in what he did, but his shakhsiyah, like his personality, his, his charisma. Wallahi, I, I was just watching uh, a video of his before this talk. And just such an amazing, amazing person. May Allah have mercy on him. You know, he said something when he got Parkinson's. Uh, and, and it is very, very powerful. You know, he said, I used to say, what was his phrase? His phrase was, I'm the greatest, Right. He used to, he's like, he said, I used to say that I'm the greatest. That was like my phrase. He said, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me this disease to remind me that he's the greatest, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? That, that this disease, subhanAllah, humbled him in a way that inshallah will secure with him Jannah. Yani secure with him, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Jannah. Because it humbled him. Maybe he had, yani he's, he's like saying, maybe I had this disease of arrogance in my heart that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala humbled me through. And that he recognized the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through. And, and that, those, those years that he experienced that Parkinson's, maybe that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, giving him that opportunity to, to earn Jannah. Right? So beautiful. So beautiful. There was another brother, you probably heard of him. You can look up his story on YouTube. Uh, amazing. His name is Ali Banat. Uh, extremely wealthy brother. I think he was in, he's in Australia. Extremely wealthy. He says himself, I was away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for so long. He says, and then I got a diagnosis that I had terminal cancer. I only had a certain amount of time to live. He said that was the, 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 the flip, yani that was the trigger, the flip, the switch in his life that brought him back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he lived the rest of his life just in, in philanthropy. Did amazing, amazing things. Yani like uh, the amount of, of you know, uh, charity work and the amount of just uh, what he did is so beautiful. You can look at his story. He says something amazing. He says, my, my only regret is that it took a doctor to tell me that my time in this world was limited. When this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told me from so much, yani so, so long before that. But I didn't realize it until it was someone in a white coat who was telling me that. Right? And so we may see cancer as evil, and it is. Right? No one's saying, you say, oh, cancer is a beautiful thing and let's, let's celebrate cancer. Right, But in this brother's life, in Ali bin Asla, do you think that he saw cancer as something that was evil? Or was it something that woke him up and that brought him back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that he was destined to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think it was two years he passed away after that diagnosis. But he was destined to meet Allah then. How much, how much do you think changed in his life as a result of that diagnosis that changes the way that he met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we see it as evil. But is it a pure evil? No. It's a relative evil and it actually becomes a mercy to him and to people like that who experience what he, what he experienced. And so based off of that, yani it, we recognize that this world, subhanAllah, what's actually important for us in this world? Right? And when we recognize the insignificance of this world in that way, it actually has the flip effect. It actually allows us to enjoy this world much more. Right? When, you, when we realize its insignificance, we lower our expectations of this world and we actually can enjoy it. You know the example of uh, that, uh, you know, if, you're, if you, go, you stop at a rest stop, 
I love stopping when I when I when I travel. Like I go to Michigan, for example, and you take you have to take two ninety four south. You pass these uh, oases, right? The the Lincoln Oasis. The they used to have they have the Hinsdale one. They used to have the O'Hare one. They closed that one. They shut it down. Uh, they destroyed it actually, but it's a whole other thing. But they have these these oases, right? And I I I just I enjoy stopping there. It's like it's like just an escape from reality, being above a highway. I don't know how, <laughs> but that's my thing, right? Imagine I go to that oasis as I'm traveling, right? And I and I bring with me wood, and I bring with me. I stopped at Home Depot on the way. I brought with me glass. I brought with me a contractor, and I start building a house there. What would you think? This guy's out of his mind, right? He's building a house at a rest stop, right? Why? Why do you think that? Because I'm only going to be here for a very short time. So me building here doesn't make any sense, okay? But if I saw that rest stop for what it was, which is a temporary stop, that then when I go to that rest stop, I'll, I'll see it for what it is and I'll enjoy it. And that's what I do. I enjoy it. I know I'm not going to stay there for, <coughs> for five, six hours. Although sometimes yeah, it's tempting. Uh, but I'll go. Maybe I'll get a Cinnabon. Maybe I'll go and get some, you know, uh, you know they have the massage chairs there. I, I don't use them. But like, you know, just I'll enjoy my time. I'm like, you know what? They have, they got a Starbucks there. I'll get myself a drink. That's where the iPass office is. You never want to have to go there, right? But I'll, I'll enjoy it because I see it for what it is. I see it for what it is. And so our lives, and I'm not saying, that doesn't mean you can't build a house in this world, right? But, but look at it relatively speaking, right? We look at the, the world for, for what it is. And if we recognize that we're passing through, then we can enjoy it more. Ibn al-Qayyim, he says something that when I heard it, it, it kind of just, it, it stopped me, right? He says, pain is the bridge to pleasure. Pain is the bridge to pleasure. That when we experience pain in this world, it allows us to, to, to benefit and to enjoy the pleasure so much more. He says, how do you think, compare Adam alayhi salam, and his experience in Jannah, when he was created and put in Jannah, compare that time in Jannah, to his, his first time in Jannah, to when he returns back to Jannah after what he went through. After eating from the tree and, and having to leave and going through the toils and the hardship of being on earth. What do you think his experience of going back into Jannah is going to be like? Do you think there's any comparison at all? Right? Do you think there's any, like him, that first step back into Jannah, like, I'm back. I'm back. After all of that, I'm back. He says, Ibn al Qayyim, he says, the Prophet ﷺ, living in Mecca, being born and raised in Mecca, what do you think it was like for him after 20 years of what he experienced? The hardships, the difficulties, the torture, the abuse, the humiliation. What do you think it was like for him to come back to Mecca? What do you think the feeling was when he stepped foot back into Mecca? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? That the, the, the relief, the, the, the enjoyment, the gratitude for coming back to the place that he experienced so much pain through. Pain is the bridge to pleasure so much in our lives. Right? And only when we experience, when we experience, you know, uh, darkness can we appreciate light. Only when we experience, not only, but a lot of times when we experience heartbreak, that's when we can appreciate what, what like, uh, uh, you know, our hearts being mended and, 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 and just healed again, really to appreciate. You know, uh, he mentioned also this uh, example. I don't know if you guys, anyone watches tennis, but there was a famous tennis player. His name was Arthur Ashe. Okay. And he was, some, he got very, very sick and he got a terminal illness and he was in uh, some type of cancer and he was going to, he it was, that's it. He was going to die. 
And so he was extremely popular back in a long time ago. I, I never watched him play or I'm not that old. Right? Uh, he was extremely popular. So they, they, his fans would like write him mail and, you know, they would back in the days of mail, like imagine it's like the DMs of today, right? And, and they would, you know, tell him how much they're supporting him and how much they love him. And, and someone asked him, they said, why did God do this to you? Like, why, why you, right? And he said something really, really amazing. Right? And he, as far as we, I don't think, you know, he didn't die as a Muslim or anything like that. But he had, this is a tremendous, wit, like a very wise saying that he said. He said, look, he said 50 million kids in the world, in the world, they try to play tennis. Okay? Only 5 million end up learning how to play tennis. I was in the 50 million who tried and didn't get to the 5 million who learned. Um, yani, table tennis maybe, but not real tennis. Right? But I'll still try and he says from those 5 million who learn, he says 500,000 go professional, approximately. 50,000 from those 500,000 make it to the professional circuit. 5,000 from those 50,000 make a grand slam. 50 from those 5,000 make Wimbledon, the, the peak of, of tennis competition, right? Four out of those 50 make the semifinals. Two make the finals. And one wins, right? And he says, he says, when I won, he won Wimbledon. He says, when I won, I never ask God, why me? And so he says, so when I have this disease now, I can't ask now, why me? When times were good, I didn't say, why me? And this is, again, uh, for us being honest with ourselves. When times were good, did we say, why, oh Allah, why me? Right? But how come when times are bad, that's when we ask Allah, why me? Right? And so, it, it, the, you know, the question of why, why me, it's, it's sometimes, and again, it's not to discount or to belittle anyone's suffering or anyone's hardship, but to recognize that it's a matter a lot of times of perspective. And again, so based off of that, the achievements of this world would be meaningless if there weren't a struggle that came with those achievements. Think about it. If there was no possibility of failure, then how could we appreciate real victory? How could we? Right? It doesn't make, it doesn't work. If I know that me taking this risk, there's no risk in it, then, then me being victorious, there's no benefit in it. Right? Suffering and hardship a lot of times serves as the spark for the flames of good, that we're, that we're meant to kindle in our lives. What makes a person heroic when rescuing people? It's the danger, it's the peril. Why are firemen looked at as so heroic, right? Because they're putting themselves in danger. If there was no danger of going into a burning building, then firemen wouldn't be considered heroic, right? But that selflessness that they exhibit, that danger that they put themselves in, that's what makes them heroic. Right? We won't be able to savor anything in life unless we, t we taste or we can taste the bitterness of that thing. Right? And that's why subhanAllah, look at it. If someone lives a life just of pure luxury, they're enslaved to their luxury, a completely easy life, right? That person doesn't know what it means to be human. You know, a lot of times people look forward to retirement, work so hard to be able to retire. Why do I want to retire so I can sit and do nothing? What ends up happening a lot of times with, that, with, with those people? Not all the time, but a lot of times. They become miserable. Why? Right? Because there, there's, no, there's nothing to live for anymore. There's no struggle. There's no hardship. How many times like you go through a hard day at work or school, or you, went, it was, you put in so much effort in this or that, at the end of the day you may be exhausted, but what do you feel? You feel accomplished. You feel happy. Compare that to a day where you don't do anything. Right? Sometimes you need that. Right? Sometimes you have that self-care and stuff and just chilling and stuff. But if you just live a life like a sloth, where it's like, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm just... Are you going to actually be happy? Actually, don't answer that. You may have right? But it's, it's going to be limited. It's going to be limited. Right? Because you're, you're, you're not... Like, you're not accomplishing anything. You're not, there's no, no risk, no reward, as they say, right? 
And that's why you see in the stories, like you have all the, these, these like people, uh, their, their, the stories of the hardship that they went through in their life. And this guy was selling bananas out of his garage. And this guy, uh, this girl, she flunked out of high school. And she, you know, uh, eventually built a, a, a Fortune 500 company. And, and Bill Gates dropped out of college but he is the richest man or he was the richest man in the world, right? People who go through this insecurity, who go through these difficulties in their life, this sometimes is the thing that carves within them the, the, the qualities and the traits that allows them to become successful and, and even historic and legendary later on in their lives, right? Because of what they went through. The Prophet ﷺ experiences how many years of being put down and being rejected and being turned away before he experiences and tastes that triumph, right? Those qualities that those sahaba that they went through, the torture and the abuse and having to remain patient, those were the very qualities that gave them the highest status in this world. Because they developed resilience and patience and perseverance and trust and strength and this, this will to never give up. Those are the things that allow this person, yani, as, as one of our teachers said, that these rocks that were the obstacles in their, on their road were actually the things that they used to build their staircase to greatness. Right? And so, you know, these things allow for us, there's no like, there's no generosity, there's no uh, compassion uh, without someone who's in need of that generosity, right? There's no ability to, to show these beautiful traits of human goodness unless you have this, uh, the other side of it to combat and to deal with and to fight against. Right, and so th that's something that's really, really important to to, to recognize, you know. Uh, and you see, Subhanallah, the 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 qualities of of forgiveness and kindness and just empathy and selflessness and and so many beautiful human traits that re that be that are reflected in times of difficulty or when they see, you know, when, when a person sees someone else going through difficulty and, and is able to help them, pull them out, get them, you know, that help that they need. And at the highest example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showing us His qualities of forgiveness. How would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us that He's the most forgiving if we didn't sin, if we didn't fall into these mistakes? How would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us how He's protecting us from evil if there was no evil that existed? So these things become necessary for us to really see life in the most beautiful way that we can, Right? And so the final thing that I'll, that I'll mention inshallah is we also have to recognize and it, and it relates to this issue as well is that the problem of evil is not a source or an evidence for atheists. It's not. It's, it has, there's no co correlation actually there. Right? Believing that evil exists and why evil and even asking the question actually is a proof against atheists because them asking that question why does evil exist means that they're recognizing that there must be purpose there must be reason there must be morality because otherwise there's no that question is invalid if we're all just random chaotic you know molecules that have been put together then there actually is no purpose Right? So you can't ask why is there evil or evil is, it doesn't make sense or it hurts and these, because it doesn't fit. Right? But even then, it's not a proof, uh, it's not a proof for you. Exactly. You're conf they're confusing the existence of Allah actually with the wisdom of Allah. They're challenging the wisdom. And what we're showing here is that Allah is showing us that definitely there is wisdom. And we just have to learn what that exactly means or how that, what that entails, right? And so, and you have to look at it. Like, what are the atheists actually asking for, right? They're, in essence, they're asking for a world, and more specifically, a human being that lacks the capacity to be human. That lacks what makes them human, which is what? Agency. The ability to choose. 
the ability to have free will, right? If you can't do wrong, if you're saying, no, no, Allah has to interfere or stop every evil or every relative evil from happening before it happens, then you're not, then there's no such thing as free will. There's no such thing as choice, right? In essence, what you're asking for is robots, right? Literally people who are like the, the, you know, the hand on a clock, like traffic lights, right? If you can't do wrong, then are you really doing anything right? Right? You're not really doing it because you don't have a choice in the matter. If there's no sadness, then what is joy? If no one fails, then what is success? I know I'm like, this is like, I'm not, I'm not trying to get really philosophical here, but really to think about it. Right? The example that one of our teachers gave, and you know, he's, uh, he's, he's, uh, I'll, I'll give a little, a little bit of a different example, but imagine a, a sports star, right? Like a, a basketball player, or a football player who never loses. A basketball player who never misses a shot. Right? It used to be me back in the day, but not, not completely, but you know, close. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, I'm joking. I'm joking. You guys are going to clown me for that. But uh, imagine that. What's the benefit? What, what's, the, what's the purpose? Right? Now people get upset. People don't like Tom Brady because he won. <laughs> I knew he was going to. I knew if Hassan was there, he was going to clown me. But uh, what's the point of, you know, people hate on Tom Brady. Why? Because he just keeps winning. They're like, it's not fun anymore. He just keeps winning. We want to see someone else win. Right? So winning and losing and equal opportunities for winning and losing is what makes life what it is. Right? If you don't have that and you have nobody who's less beautiful than anybody else, everyone's exactly the same because there's no, there's no different levels. No motivation to discover anything. Right? No one is going to die because that's a, that's a shortcoming, that's an evil. No one can anticipate or will anticipate what's, what's to come in the future because we already know what's going to happen. There's no differences in health, wealth, beauty, uh, <laughs> uh, reputation, intelligence, right? Can you imagine that ideal world that the atheists are trying to paint for us? An, I, an ideal world that's void of all evil is actually the worst potential world that you can ever imagine. It's, it's, a, a, it's a dystopia. It's tragic. It's scary. And as our teacher, he said, it's a world that we think Allah only exists in the mind or in the imagination of the atheists. But rather, what has Allah given us instead? He has given us a world that is perfect to fulfill the objective of this dunya. To fulfill that. This world is perfect. But it's perfect in its being imperfect. Right? Because that's the point of the dunya. Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us an opportunity to, to set for ourselves a plan to have... An, yes, it's, a, it's an uphill climb for the human being. But through making that uphill climb, the human being is able to power through and struggle through your own weaknesses and acknowledge and accept your humanity, right? And humble yourself to the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and recognize that you're strong because of the strength that Allah gives you. And you're able to overcome because of the help that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. And then at the pinnacle of that uphill climb, that the human being has the opportunity to become the best of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ خَيْرُ الْبَرِيَّةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the ones who believe and do righteous deeds, they are the best of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Better than who? Better than even the angels, as the scholars say. Because the angels don't know what it's like to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the human being who is able to overcome, who is able to struggle through this life and get to that pinnacle and get to that to having that, that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make it to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that person deserves to have that title as the best of creation. Right? And so 
through that, through you know, this, this brief look, we're able to see that, you know, that the problem of evil is not really a problem. And again, I'm not negating the existence of suffering or saying it's easy to experience. And oh yeah, alhamdulillah, I'm just suffering in my life and it's great. But this, and just to, to, to reframe our perspective, to change the way that we see this world in order for us to be able to get through the struggles that we experience, in order for us to see the wisdoms and the difficulties that we face, to enjoy the victories, to enjoy the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has, even, uh, has, has given us in our lives, and, and to make it uh, even subhanAllah so much more enjoyable. And that's why you see, yeah, yeah, the, the, those who struggle and have Allah, right? Those people live the most beautiful lives. Even if they don't have all of the material things that we think make happiness in this world, right? Because happiness and, and, and success and, and inner peace doesn't come from those things that are, that are around us. It comes from what's inside. It comes from our connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, and Allah is so generous and He gives and He continues to give. And He gives us so many moments and so much opportunity and so much in, in this world of, of happiness and, and joy and the relationships that we have and, and all of these things, right? But that paired with the struggles, paired with, you know, what we see around us, you know, in our own lives, but then around us as well in, in, in the world, are, uh, make this world and make this life what it is. And subhanAllah, you know, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is, uh, it is a beautiful life. It is a, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us all uh, that inner peace, that joy, that, that connection with Him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us, uh, you know, to give us a life of, uh, of afiyah. You know, we don't ask for, for hardships or for evil or for, for these things to afflict us. But if and when they do, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the strength to, to reframe our perspectives. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the strength to uh, overcome. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow these things to bring us closer to Him. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Look, my, I see some of the comments here. Like I said in the beginning, if you weren't with us in the beginning, I'm literally taking this. This is not me, right? This is just me taking this from... Uh, a beautifully written and, uh, and, and articulated article that you can find on Yaqeen Institute uh, titled, I think, The Problem of Evil by Sheikh Muhammad al-Shannawi, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, who we're going to be having as a guest soon, inshallah, in a couple of weeks. And that's really where you can see this written and, and, and I think articulated much better than I did. Uh, and also, it's something that the, a lot of the scholars have spoken about and have you know, talked about the benefits in the struggles that we experience. But may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and give us all what's best for us and allow us to, 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 to meet Him with Him pleased with us. Uh, you know, we say these things, but it's much easier to, to say than to live and to apply. So may Allah forgive us for our shortcomings in that. Uh, there is an opportunity also. This is part of, you know, this discussion of the problem of evil is part of uh, a class that's going to be offered, inshallah, I think this coming weekend through Al Maghrib, through a very, very dear friend and uh, someone that I benefit from and look up to, Sheikh Suleiman Hani. He's going to be talking about atheism in general and signs and the existence of Allah. And part of this is the problem of evil. Uh, and, and so I, I really, really, really suggest that you take the class, inshallah. You can go on uh, the Al Maghrib Chicago. Well, there's the URL. Jazakallah khair. And you can check it out, inshallah. Uh, and then hopefully what we, what we discuss today will be of benefit to those who maybe are struggling with this concept or are having a hard time, you know, uh, making sense of certain things that are happening in their lives. And uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ease the suffering of those who are suffering. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to... Uh, Remove the insecurities of those who have those insecurities. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, bring us to Him, to, to entrench our faith in Him, and to never allow us to 
stray from him or to turn away from him or for his help and his guidance and his afia and his mercy and his ease to be taken away from us because of our ingratitude or because of our, you know, uh, you know, uh, our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive uh, all of us and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us and our families and our loved ones. Jazakumullahu khair. We'll see you all inshallah. We have a live this Friday. See you this Friday. Assalamu alaikum.